thank you, Peg, and thank you for having me. Why there are words, and thank everybody for coming. I guess you can hear all right. Uh, I'm going to read a short excerpt from this short novel uh, called. Uh, the excerpt is called Stonehenge. The whole novel, the narrator is a young woman, Alice. She's in her 30s. She works as a word processor at a law firm in San Francisco. Um, she's having a somewhat troubled relationship with a coworker, David, uh, and also with her supervisor, Fran. She's having a lot of difficulties at this point in her life. She thinks about killing herself at times. She thinks about killing somebody else. She's bought a gun. Uh, and at this place, uh, towards the end, uh, she's home on the weekend in her apartment. She had kind of a scene with David on Friday at work, so she's pretty distressed. And this is what she has to say. How often during the past 48 hours have I almost called him? It would be the third time I've called him at this time of night over the past few months. Of course, I never said a word when he answered. But you can tell a lot by the quality of the silence at the, on the end of the line. I could tell he was alone, with no one in the background asking who dared or felt they had the right to call that late. I think it was unusual that he never sounded annoyed or impatient. He sounded open. You could say that calling David at 3 a.m. brought out the best in him. He didn't sound as if he'd say, Alex, what the hell are you doing if I identified myself? He sounded as if he'd put on his jeans and pick me up and take me to Mel's drive-in where no one drives in anymore, but it's open 24 hours and buy me coffee and not ask any questions. It might be unrealistic to expect him to not ask any questions. I'd have to ask him not to ask, and that would be out of the question. Which is an interesting way to put it, worthy of Heidegger or one of those other Nazis. Whether or not to live as if nothing is out of the question is the question. It must have been less than 10 seconds of silence before he hung up. But it was a couple more than necessary. It was enough to give me a chance to change my mind and say something, or just share a moment of silence as if we were at Point Reyes or the Vietnam Wall. It's the stretching of silence a couple seconds beyond what's necessary. Like during sex, when you stop and are perfectly still for a couple seconds when stillness is the last thing you want. But that is when the other thing comes in. Not love, not pleasure or pain, something more like the light that falls on the winter solstice on the altar stone at Stonehenge. More like the sound of a meteor shower, the silence of that golden swarm that would be deafening if only you could hear it as if your senses had changed their gender and you could smell what you see miles away, sage on the marine headlands at the far side of the bridge. You could hear the creak of a distant lighthouse as the beam turns and feel the rough wool of the fisherman's peacoat chafing his neck. Sometimes I hear the voices of everything at once, all the silent things, the flagstones in the park, the dew on the pink thyme overgrowing their jagged edges. The stone Buddha, granite carved into the image of a man who after great struggle attained the stillness of stone. The burning tip of the cigarette dangling from the mouth of the ancient waitress taking her break on the sidewalk outside the dim sum parlor, having outlived three or four children, savoring the last sweet drag. The darkness of the night sky, the centuries of astronomers still unable to explain why it's dark when it's full of stars. They should ask me. 
the trigonometry of the angles formed by the lines between David's apartment and mine and our office in the pyramid shadow, the complex equations of tangents and sines and how they define the waves radiating from the iron grid of street lamps. And the infinite what ifs. What if he'd had a different book the first time I saw him with the unbearable lightness of being? What if on the Oregon coast that night I hadn't seen a fisherman with his hand on the blindfolded girl's shoulder as he guided her across the slick rocks? What if the high water had come a few minutes sooner and the moon jelly that washed ashore had been swept back out? What if the bus driver hadn't left us to dash into Connie's for coffee to go and pause for a second on the sidewalk before coming back lost in his own what if? What if the electricity hadn't confined itself to the copper wire, but leapt to the shallow pond on the porch slats after the rain? What if my mother hadn't been afraid to love me? What if my father had gone after the woman he wanted, the dancer? I'm sure it was a dancer, or at least someone who liked to foxtrot at the top of the mark. Someone who knew that way a dancer has, but not exactly celebrating but manifesting? What if the earth were tilted one degree more on its axis than its 23 degree obliquity? I love that term, the obliquity of the ecliptic. Whatever it is, it creates the seasons as we know them. And an argument, a very good one could be made, that the seasons as we know them are not only what makes life possible, but what make it worth the possibility what if there is a God and he or she or it loves beauty more than justice or bliss and knows there's more in Juliet's dagger than any happy ending? The sunset after the crucifixion was unforgettable. What if a comet had not exploded 150 million years ago and a six mile fragment had not crashed into the Yucatan and raised a cloud of dust so vast that photosynthesis ceased on Earth for long enough that the dinosaurs became extinct or evolved into birds. Would we hear the same echoes now in the song of a nightingale? What if the first man slash boy I kissed had not been such a jerk? How could I let him hurt me like that? I didn't even like his music. I didn't like the white he painted his room. It reminded me of Coast Guard uniforms. I wanted to rearrange his furniture and couldn't explain how it was turned the wrong way. He thought I wanted to move in, but I didn't have anything to do with that. I literally couldn't sit on his couch unless he moved it against the north wall so the light and shadows would fall differently, more sharply outlined, but he wouldn't do it. And by the next morning, the whole school knew what a crazy bitch I was. And I didn't even like his accent, the way he pronounced my name as if it were one syllable, Alice. I let him slip me, I let him clean me, and I didn't even like his shoes. <laughs>